Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the COVID-19 Prevention in Healthcare and in the Community Conversations with Frontline Practitioners webinar hosted by Drexel University Online and presented by faculty from Drexel University's Dornsife School of Public Health. My name is Raina Lopez, Manager of Events and Conferences. Before we get started, I would like to take care of a few housekeeping items. First, please click the icon of a raised hand if you can hear me. Okay, great. For questions or comments, please use the area entitled Q&A. We will do our best to get to everyone's questions at the end of the presentation. Lastly, we want everyone to know this presentation is being recorded and will be sent in a follow-up email. I would like to take a quick moment to introduce to you Drexel University. For those of you who aren't familiar, Drexel has a long-standing history in providing quality education. Founded in 1891, Drexel is one of the largest not-for-profit universities in the U.S. We are located in Philadelphia with about 11,000 students on campus. We also have more than 6,700 unique students online and 13,000 students taking at least one online course. Drexel is a military friendly university and is among a small group of universities with no cap on the number of veterans who may enroll through the Yellow Ribbon Program, which provides tuition free education to eligible veterans. Drexel currently offers over 150 fully online degree and certificate programs tailored to working professionals. At Drexel University, more than 86% of the faculty have a PhD or the highest degree in their field. In addition to teaching, many of them are also currently working in their field of expertise, allowing them to stay on top of current trends and best practices. Drexel is proud to offer over 150 online programs designed for working professionals like yourself. If you would like to learn more about these programs, we invite you to visit online.drexel.edu. And with that, we are happy to begin presenting, uh, introducing today's presenters. We are happy to have three members of the public health field join us today. To begin, I present to you our moderator, Dr. Esther Chermak. Associate Clinical Professor at Drexel University's Dornsife School of Public Health and the Director of, of the Center for Public Health Readiness and Communication. Professor Chernick. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to host this webinar with two really terrific presenters uh, who are really working on the front lines of public health. So what I'd like to do is introduce each of them and then they'll each uh, give some prepared remarks, and hopefully we will have time at the remainder of the webinar uh, to take some questions uh, from, the, from the participants. So our first presenter is Ms. Jessica Kamm. Jessica Kamm is the program manager for the Bioterrorism and Public Health Preparedness Program at the Philadelphia Department of Public Health, where she has worked since 2011. In this role, Jessica has led and supported planning and response initiatives for a variety of public health emergencies, ranging from extreme weather events to infectious disease outbreaks. Since the pandemic began, Jessica has been involved in various components of the department's response to COVID-19, including most recently working to coordinate community-based COVID-19 vaccination clinics. Jessica has an MPH from Drexel University's Dornsife School of Public Health, where she teaches as an adjunct professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health and teaches a course called Public Health and Disaster Preparedness, which is one of the fundamental components or key courses in our graduate minor in public health emergency preparedness. Our second speaker is Ms. Sarah Smathers. Ms. Smathers is the System Director of Infection Prevention and Control at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, or CHOP, the oldest and first hospital dedicated to children in one of the largest pediatric networks, networks in the United States. She is currently chair of the Public Policy Committee for the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology, known in the field as APIC, and previously served as president of the Delaware Valley Philadelphia APIC chapter. Sarah is also an adjunct professor 
at the Dorrance Hive School of Public Health and the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health. And she co-directs our Infectious Disease Prevention and Control Certificate at the School of Public Health and serves also on the steering committee to establish a county health department for Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Sarah trained um, in hospital and molecular epidemiology. She earned her master's degree in public health from the University of Michigan and is certified in infection control and also serves as an APIC fellow with an interest in infection prevention program and development. So with those introductions, Let's begin with Jessica's comments, and uh, she will share her perspectives working in at the front lines of the Philadelphia Department of Public Health during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Jessica. Good afternoon, everyone. So I will start by providing an overview of the Philadelphia Department of Public Health, provide some background on the preparedness program, and then talk specifically about some of our roles uh, in planning and responding to the current pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit about the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. Uh, the mission of the department is to promote and protect the health of all Philadelphians. We have 10 divisions plus the health commissioner's office. So some of the other divisions include ambulatory health services, which runs our health centers, uh, environmental health, the medical examiner's office, air management, and a few others. I work in the Division of Disease Control, which is, as you can probably guess by the name, completely focused on disease uh, prevention and control uh, for infectious diseases. And there are seven other programs in our division, including the Acute Clinical Disease Program, uh, Healthcare Associated Infections, Immunizations and Epidemiology, among a few others. But these are the programs that we work very, very closely with in preparedness. So currently we have about 30 staff in the preparedness program. This is the largest the program has ever been, at least since my time with the department. Uh, some of the staff include planners, uh, analysts, communications and outreach personnel, uh, response specialists, uh, people who advise on some of our clinical plans. And so we have had the opportunity in the last several months with some additional federal funding in order to really um, augment our staffing, which was only about 12 people when the pandemic started. So pretty small program at the start, uh, but has gotten bigger and will continue to grow, I think, over the coming months. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about some of our roles in, in public health preparedness and some of the work that we do for the department. So our, really our core issue is to plan and respond to public health emergencies uh, including disease outbreaks and pandemics, severe weather, uh, mass care and sheltering events, environmental and chemical disasters, sorry about my phone, um, bioterrorism and radiological events. So we do a lot of work in planning for these types of events. Uh, and to do that, we develop plans, we test those plans, and then we regularly update this entire portfolio of response plans that we have for the hazards that have been identified as either high probability and or high severity for Philadelphia. We conduct a lot of trainings, we do a lot of exercises to identify gaps and build capacity. Uh, and then we also do a lot of evaluation to identify where we might have issues, where we need to do things differently. And then we will revise our plans and protocols accordingly. Next slide, please. One of the other core functions of our program is to manage the Philadelphia unit of the Medical Reserve Corps which currently has over 6,000 volunteers. This is a group of volunteers, both medical and non-medical, who help us to respond to different things that happen in Philadelphia. So the MRC has been very critical in responding to the COVID pandemic, has also been involved in responding to the flights of Afghan evacuees at the Philadelphia airport, uh, supports a lot of citywide special events. So going back to the people visit, the Democratic National Convention, uh, they do support for races and concerts. And so we administer that program. I've included the web link here. This is a great way for people who are interested in emergency response to get a little bit of experience with this work and really get sort of a taste of the work that we do. So the, the link uh, there provides some additional information for anyone who may be interested in enrolling. So a few other roles that we have in preparedness, uh, we conduct a lot of community outreach. So working with partners, working with communities and residents uh, to try to build preparedness prior to events. And then of course, doing response uh, once events have already happened. Uh, we manage the Health Alert Network, which is an emergency notification system uh, for public health, healthcare, and emergency response personnel. This is part of an initiative that CDC launched in 1999, and it's something that we operate locally and is really one of our main communication pathways for our healthcare providers. 
Uh, in fact, we just had a health alert out this week to advise providers on COVID-19 uh, vaccine boosters. We also coordinate emergency communications within the department. So anytime there is an emergency that is affecting our staff or the city or uh, our buildings, we operate those broadcast messaging systems to alert staff. Uh, and then finally, we represent the health department in citywide emergency planning and coordination. So we do a lot of work with other city agencies uh, like the Office of Emergency Management, the fire department, the police department. And so we, this program really uh, serves as the representative for a lot of those citywide coordination uh, planning meetings. Next slide, please. So I just want to talk a little bit about our roles prior to the pandemic and then what we've been doing during the pandemic. So prior to COVID-19, pandemic was certainly at the top of our list of scenarios to be uh, prepared for. It was something that was identified uh, over a number of years in a, a risk assessment that we worked with uh, Drexel on developing. Actually, Dr. Chernak's group uh, was critical in doing that work. So it was always something that we knew and recognized as our number one threat. And so a lot of planning work went into trying to develop our plans, do tests of our plans, and train for a pandemic uh, event. A lot of the previous planning was very focused on pandemic influenza. So we do have a pandemic influenza plan that dates back many years. It was actually recently updated before the COVID pandemic happened. So we did have a framework, uh, although there are some obvious differences between COVID uh, and, it, and a novel influenza pandemic. Uh, we also engaged in some special, special pathogens planning. So this was particularly important uh, with Ebola back in 2014 and some of the work that we did there, engaging with our uh, healthcare partners and um, various preparations that were made in the event that we would ever have cases here. Uh, and then that really branched into some more general special pathogens planning to really prepare for any emerging infectious disease. And then we do a lot of coordination with partners as well. Uh, we had actually run a pandemic workshop just a few months before COVID-19 started. And uh, the point of those workshops is really just to make uh, partners aware of what key responsibilities and roles are, uh, what the health department is responsible for. And so we had just been doing, we had gone through uh, a workshop in the fall of, um, I guess it was 2019 with some of our partners uh, just to, to share the updated pandemic influenza plan and to really engage our, our citywide partners in that. And then we routinely do exercises and real events with other partners. So for instance, we do mass vaccination clinics for seasonal influenza. Uh, we do a series of those every fall. In fact, we have three coming up in October uh, with first responders. And this is really a mechanism for us to be able to test how good and how fast we can be at administering either antibiotics or vaccine to first responders in the event of a real emergency. So that's work that we've been doing for about a decade uh, and we'll continue to do in, uh, work on into the future. Next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit more about our specific roles during COVID. Uh, so one of the early things that we did in this program uh, and coordinated some other healthcare, uh, I'm sorry, health department resources to do this was to set up the mass testing site at Citizens Bank Park that was operating in March of uh, right after the, the pandemic had really gotten started and we had our first cases here. And so this was a very large drive through testing site uh, that we operated with a lot of support from many in the Drexel community. We had many MRC volunteers engaged in this. Uh, lots of support for this, this massive testing operation. So this ran for about three weeks, uh, and then we transitioned some of the testing uh, to other healthcare partners to absorb that into the healthcare infrastructure. We also did a lot of management of personal protective equipment and testing inventory. So probably everyone remembers at the beginning of the pandemic, there were extreme shortages in both testing uh, materials as well as personal protective equipment. And so we worked very closely with our Office of Emergency Management and other partners in order to procure equip, uh, PPE. Uh, we worked very hard to procure additional testing inventory, and then we're able to share some of that inventory with healthcare partners, um, with long-term care facilities, and with shelters, with all the other partners who were also struggling uh, to come up with these supplies. So we became really a broker uh, for a lot of those materials. I already mentioned the Health Alert Network. So we have, of course, 
sent out a lot of health alerts and advisories uh, over the last year and a half. And so again, that is our, our one of our main mechanisms for coordinating with our healthcare partners uh, in sharing critical information. Uh, we have done a lot of community-based education and outreach over the last year and a half, uh, building on relationships that already existed, and then also really initiating some new relationships that we did not have with some partners. And so there's been a lot of network building over the last year and a half, and this is work that will absolutely continue into the future. Um, also coordinating and information sharing with other partners across all sectors. So I mentioned work that we've done with emergency management, police department, the fire department, uh, our partners at OEM also convened a number of other different groups where we participated in order to make sure that we were also working with the transportation sector and the private sector and other organizations uh, and sectors that, of course, have all been impacted by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. In August of 2020 is when we really started to begin planning for the vaccine rollout. And we did this work very closely with our immunization program that has been the lead for this. Uh, so we started our planning back in August. Um, it was a very busy time in the fall trying to pull plans together while vaccine was in production. There were a lot of variables. Uh, but finally, when vaccine did arrive in December, we began operating vaccination clinics. Next slide, please. So a little bit more about vaccine distribution in Philadelphia. Uh, one of the challenges that we really had to deal with last fall was planning, but planning in the context of missing variables and information about the different scenarios that could potentially happen. Uh, so we had to prepare for multiple vaccine scenarios and um, really try to do our best work uh, given the information that we had, even though it was incomplete. And so that was pretty challenging. Uh, we were dealing with a couple of different vaccines that were in production. It wasn't clear yet which vaccines would eventually uh, be authorized under the emergency use authorization. Uh, and then, of course, we, we started with some vaccines that are two-dose series. So very challenging variables had to go into the planning here. Uh, and then we started with our, our own vaccine clinics. And I just want to distinguish the ones that we operated in disease control, were really community-oriented uh, versus the, the large role that our health centers have had in also uh, providing vaccine through their networks. Uh, so we did, uh, we've done a lot of clinics with um, the community. Uh, we actually started our clinics for unaffiliated healthcare workers. So you may, may remember at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, healthcare workers were identified as a group that was high priority for the initial round of vaccinations. Uh, but what we learned was that there were a lot of healthcare workers who were not necessarily affiliated with a large healthcare system that was able to manage the Pfizer product due to the ultra cold vaccine storage that is a requirement for, for that particular vaccine. And so we worked with some of our other, uh, some of our other healthcare workers uh, in some of our behavioral health hospitals, uh, home healthcare workers in trying to provide vaccine for all of those healthcare workers who just didn't have another way to get it at the time. Uh, we de developed a mobile team model so that we could visit some uh, congregate facilities and other high-risk populations. Uh, we really started with some of those behavioral health facilities that did not, have a, did not have a way to vaccinate staff. And then we expanded that model to include shelters and other, other congregate settings uh, where we were able to vaccinate both staff and then residents once eligibility opened up. Our current focus continues to be on operating community-based clinics to really promote vaccine ac access and equity across the city. We have a number of areas of the city that have low vaccination rates, may have fewer vaccination resources available, and so we've really tried to focus our resources in those parts of the city and really try to promote that vaccine access. Um, overall, we've now conducted over 500 clinics since this effort began last December, and we are continuing forward with both boosters and starting to gear up for pediatric vaccinations, which we anticipate there may be some vaccine approvals for Pfizer coming through maybe later this uh, later in October. Uh, we expect by the end of the year, and so we're getting ready to plan for pediatric vaccinations for children age 5 to 11. Next slide, please. And I just want to draw attention to something that happened very recently, which was this intersecting emergency situation. So we had the ongoing pandemic response happening. And then we, Philadelphia, started to receive evacuees from Afghanistan. Uh, and an effort was set up at the airport to be able to greet them and to uh, provide different clinical services, including testing, 
uh, vaccination, and then also triage to identify anyone who had an immediate health issue that needed attention. And that was also then happening over this period of time from the end of August uh, into September 10th, uh, when we also had the remnants of Hurricane Ida moving through the region, which caused significant flooding uh, in Philadelphia and then in our surrounding region as well. So I think one of the things we've learned from this experience is that there really is not a playbook for responding to multiple simultaneous emergencies, uh, but we are certainly living in a world where this may become more and more the norm, where we have these multiple things happening simultaneously and we need to be able to respond to all of them. Next slide, please. I just want to share a few lessons learned. Uh, I think one of the things that we've really observed is, is that planning is really important. So even when the response work take, changes course or moves away from your previous planning assumptions, planning does provide the framework for approaching complex problems. Uh, it provides the framework for working with partners. Uh, even if your plans need to be adaptable and scalable and you need to make changes, I think the planning really provides the right framework for being able to, to build upon. I think we've also observed that response plans would greatly benefit from additional community input prior to emergencies. So uh, one of the things we'll be working on is being able to solicit more input from community members on response plans before emergencies actually happen so that we make sure that they are well tailored and are appropriate for all community members. One of the other things we've observed is the importance of community-based relationships. We've fostered a lot of new relationships during COVID uh, that have been so critically important to getting vaccine out, getting information out. And so we really need to maintain these relationships so that the networks are in place when the next emergency happens. And even though it may be something completely different, the communication pathways that have been established will really be essential for us to work through uh, new emergencies. And then I think a, an important point uh, to note here also is that often public health decisions need to be made with incomplete information and sometimes without public support. Uh, so we all need to be prepared for controversy and unintended consequences. I think a few um, instances of this have come up recently. It was just last week when there was some controversy around the eligibility for boosters and the FDA advisory panel went with one set of recommendations, the advisory committee on immunization practices had another set of recommendations and then the CDC director needed to make a decision and ultimately uh, went with the, the FDA's uh, advice on making vaccine boosters available for people who may be high risk due to residential or occupational exposures. Uh, so I think this is going to be an ongoing issue. Um, you know, another example of the, the potential unintended consequences has to do with some of the vaccine mandates that have come out recently at the local level, what's coming out of the federal level, and a lot of concern that we're hearing about even though the, it's, these vaccine mandates are very important for healthcare workers, the potential uh, that, that there may be workforce shortages, uh, we've heard that a bit from the home healthcare sector, that there are concerns about these impacts that the mandates will have on the workforce. So uh, I think just think it's really important to consider that we have to make decisions sometimes that are sometimes unpopular, Sometimes we have to make them with incomplete information uh, and they need to be modified later. So just um, something that I've defi definitely taken away from the last year and a half. Uh, next slide, please. So just a, a final word on some future directions for public health preparedness in Philadelphia. We're certainly going to be building upon everything that we've learned over the last 18 months. I think we can look at all of our plans through the COVID lens and think about what worked well during COVID, what did not work, and how do we need to change all of our emergency response plans so that they're just going to be better in the future. Uh, again, continuing to foster relationships with community and faith-based partners, uh, and then really building greater staffing capacity and investing in our workforce, which is just so important uh, for every emergency response effort. I wanted to highlight um, something that I also think is really important, and that is responder safety and health. I included a link here to an MMWR article that came out um, a little while ago based on a CDC survey that was done uh, among public, the public health workforce. It really points to some pretty important uh, indicators about mental health among the public health workforce. So I would encourage everyone to take a look at that uh, if you have an opportunity. And I think my final slide is next. Uh, so just some broader themes that I want to end on, I think one thing that's incredibly important will be to maintain this ongoing interest and investment in public health. We are rarely in the public eye until something bad is happening, and we have been in the public eye a lot. 
uh, over the last year and a half. So I think we really need to maintain that interest and maintain the investment in public health. Uh, we need to promote the value of the public health workforce. So I think we're seeing some of that is happening with some of the funding that's coming out and some of the focus on the public health workforce, but that is just incredibly important. I think we're seeing a lot of attrition right now in the workforce. And so it's just really important that we continue to focus on building up this workforce for the current response as well as future emergencies. Uh, and to do that, we need long-term and sustainable funding mechanisms. So we uh, in emergency preparedness have been working on pretty small budgets for a number of years. There is now a lot more federal funding that's become available. However, that funding needs to be sustainable. It can't just be available for two years and then go away. It does need to be sustainable long-term. And then finally, I think everything that we've learned over the last 18 months can be used to shape our future preparedness planning to augment our resources and to address all the major gaps that we've identified uh, to improve our state of readiness for the next emergency. Thank you, everyone. Jessica, thank you. That was terrific. Um, really, uh, so much, so much information <clears throat> really encapsulated in a very, in a very succinct presentation. Let's switch gears and uh, turn to Sarah, who will share with us uh, her perspectives on infection prevention in the context of healthcare. Thank you, Esther, and thank you, Jessica. I think you're all gonna hear some synergies um, between Jessica's talk and, and my own, which is really crucially important when thinking about um, the public health and, and healthcare um, partnership during, during these types of crises. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, I think one more. Um, so I, I wanted to start off by talking just a little bit about my journey to becoming an infection preventionist through the lens of some of these previous emerging infectious diseases. Um, and then, excuse me, I wanted to start off by just talking about SARS-1, which was um, a emerging infectious diseases when I was a graduate student. So I was at the University of Michigan in the early 2000s, and it was really the first time that I understood that there was a threat of emerging diseases, um, and it really sparked my interest in infection prevention and control. Uh, a few years later, I was uh, a new infection preventionist, and the, the very month I joined the department here at CHOP, there was the emergence of H1N1 as a you know, pandemic influenza. And then a few years after that, when I became manager of the department, um, just a few short months after becoming manager, we had our first case of Ebola on U.S. soil in, in Dallas, Texas. And so really brought home the need to be prepared for return travelers walking into our doors and being able to respond to that and keep our patients and our employees safe and, and healthy. And um, just a few you know, years and months after that response, we were seeing another novel coronavirus, um, MERS, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, emerge and, and also were preparing and screening return travelers in order to prevent spread of that um, novel coronavirus. So I just wanted to share that as my journey of an infection preventionist and also to um, reference this meme that you see here from Men in Black. And so I, I do think infection preventionists um, and public health folks are the men in black. We are behind the scenes, keeping the public, keeping our employees, keeping our staff and our patients safe. Um, and when we do our job well, nobody knows that we exist. And that is... Um, also our curse in that it's very difficult to maintain readiness um, and funding for some of the critical issues that we need to respond and continue training for. When they are only happening every few years, a healthcare sister, a system may not see the, the benefits of investing in that when they have other competing priorities, they have limited resources, and it's not re generating revenue to, to maintain readiness for something that's every few years. And in the case of COVID, a once in 100 year event. Next slide. I, I do want to talk a little bit about um, some of the previous pandemic planning that has worked in healthcare. And so the CDC did commission in the early 2000s a few hospitals. There were three hospitals that were selected to serve as biocontainment units. And these remained at the ready with staff and personnel dedicated to ongoing training and support in order to be able to respond to um, highly transmissible pathogens. And so these are things like viral hemorrhagic fever. Um, and at this time, there were a lot of concerns about bioterrorism agents. And so they were ready to um, have evacuated American citizens who were maybe coming from areas with outbreaks of Ebola virus disease and care for them safely. But they were also there to, um, in case there was a bioterrorism event that they needed to um, respond and care for patients with. 
So there were a couple examples of that um, ongoing readiness happening in some healthcare systems, but it was very few. Like I mentioned, it was only about three. So there are very few hospitals who had taken the lessons from SARS-1 and applied that to H1N1. I remember being a brand new infection preventionist, and that was my first question to my peers. Well, where is all of our um, planning, our response, our policies and procedures about SARS-1, another respiratory illness, and how can we apply that to pandemic flu? And instead, we were recreating work um, that we probably could have learned from earlier. There is another really great example of how funding did help support ongoing readiness, and that's with the grant funding that occurred after Ebola. So in 2014 and 2015, multiple hospitals across the country were preparing to um, you know, potentially see somebody walk into their emergency department with Ebola, and all of those lessons learned uh, about planning and readiness were not something that we wanted to repeat. And so there was funding available, and um, they were it was given to several regional, state, and assessment centers, so only about 200 total, but those 200 hospitals were able to maintain their readiness and their planning and their ongoing training and support because they had the funds external to their organization to do that. Next slide. So moving on to our current pandemic with the COVID-19 response, most healthcare facilities initially opened their hospital incident command center, and that served as a central response to the pandemic. And you can see a little um, pictorial representation here where you have a, an incident commander who's really kind of pulling the strings and, and leveraging and managing the um, the incident that's happening, and this could be an emerging disease, but it could also be a weather-related event, as, as Jessica mentioned, um, the, the Afghan evacuees, like any crisis that we're faced with, we can use this very same structure. And so in, in the case of COVID-19, the medical and technical specialist was an infectious disease physician or an infection preventionist. And then you had several key people from across the organization who were able to quickly move work along. And so you needed to make change happen fast. You need to be able to disseminate information fast, and so you had really key players who were able to do that, supporting the entire operation. One of the things that we quickly learned um, throughout all of our healthcare facilities is that it is very difficult to maintain a hospital incident command structure and be in crisis mode for months, two years. And so there needed to be a shift in how we thought about our response. And so maintaining a bioresponse um, task force or a COVID-19 task force is a direction that many hospitals went to. And then this task force approach really allowed them to have a tiered response. And so you could identify key work streams. You could have leaders for each of the work streams and identify your key um, team and players who needed to help move those work streams along. And then you could report up any kind of needs to um, you know, senior level of the, of the leadership. And so this is the um, current model that many hospitals are in is, is this task force um, type model. Next slide. I wanted to show a little bit about what a task force might look like and um, what are the different key work streams that would be identified. And so these are some of the key ones that I've identified. Um, and really you have at the top your bioresponse leadership. So these are the people that you escalate your concerns and, your, and they remove barriers for you. And then you have buckets of work within the task force. I'm gonna just quickly talk about each of these buckets of work so you have better understanding of what they mean. Um, the first is point of entry screening. And so you're probably all familiar with this because you've gone to a doctor's office or you've had you know, dental care and they've asked you, have you been exposed to COVID-19? Do you have a current test pending? Do you have any of these symptoms? And so point of entry screening is really important for any place where you're going to initially see patients. So it could be your emergency department, it could be an ambulatory clinic, it could be um, your urgent care and really asking them these questions so you can identify if a person is at risk of having infectious disease and then you can isolate them appropriately your staff knows what kind of personal protective equipment they need to wear and you can safely care for that that patient without um, having transmission to others in the facility Next, you have on um, these buckets of work isolation units. And so the, the real key thing about isolation units is that you're caring for all of the same type of patient in one area. That allows you to pool your resources. Again, healthcare facilities have very limited resources and you know finite amount of staff. And so you can have your finite um, group of resources available, your supplies, your um, when you have to train people, you know you just have these you know, 500, 200 people that you have to train and retrain. And so isolation units is really a, a clever way to kind of 
keep everything contained in one area and so that it's more manageable. Uh, you heard a little bit about lab and testing from Jessica, and so uh, with um, the COVID task force in the healthcare facility, we really found this to be a critical component of how we prevent transmission. And so we need to know what people have so we can isolate them appropriately. And um, they were, it was very difficult to get tests early in the pandemic. I can tell you as a parent of a child who was sick last week, it's also still very difficult to get timely tests. Um, and so that is an ongoing need in, in our healthcare organizations. Next, we have education and training. Really early on in the pandemic, we know things were shifting. We were learning quickly. Um, we had to adapt and train and retrain and re-educate. And so it was crucial to have a way to do that quickly um, and have a process and um, be, to be able to flip the switch and say, okay, we need to go on this new um, new way of, of taking care of patients and somebody needs to train everybody on this new um, piece of personal protective equipment that we just got in because we had to substitute um, for something else that we had run out of. And that leads me to my next bucket, which is the resources and assets. Um, we all know that we had supply chain shortages. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, people were running out of toilet paper, they were running out of hand sanitizer. We experienced all of this in healthcare facilities as well. So we had to be innovative in how we were planning and preparing to make sure that our staff remained safe and that we had everything that we needed, not only to keep them safe, but also also to um, maintain care of our patients as um, the products that we use to care for our patients were also in critical supply. As a pediatric facility, I can say family management is, is really at the, the utmost of the care that we provide. Um, it's really critically important that we keep caregivers present with their child. I can also say for long-term care facilities, this is a huge um, area uh, and challenge in limiting visitors to the elderly who were then socially isolated, um, which led to depression and um, and social isolation had other medical issues um, related to it as well. And so family management and knowing what your visitation strategy is in order to be able to screen those individuals so they can keep families together um, in, a, you know, um, in a responsible way. Next, we have employee safety. And so it was really important that we didn't have exposures to our employees. And we did that through the use of personal protective equipment, but we also needed to be able to screen our employees, make sure they weren't coming to work sick and spreading things to their other colleagues and coworkers, that we were able to test them rapidly if they did develop symptoms, that we could counsel them if they had been exposed, um, either in the community or if they perceived an exposure in the healthcare facility, that we were able to talk to them about what that meant and, and reassure them and get them quick testing and give them recommendations on quarantine or isolation. Next, we have clinical care management. This is really how we took care of the patient. And that is everything from where do we put the patient in the hospital so that we keep them safe and that they're not transmitting things to other people to um, how do we care for them? What treatments do we have for them? And those things were rapidly changing and evolving um, as, well, as well as like what kind of equipment we use. Um, and then the last was communications. And so communications is really one of the most critical parts of our response, but it's also the first thing to um, kind of go away during an emergency. And so um, communications is very, very challenging when people are responding to a crisis and um, there are multiple competing you know, fires to put out. And we did um, need to have communication both to our patients and our families to reassure them that it was safe to come in and get care and what was expected of them when they came to get care. But then also we needed to um, communicate with our employees as things were rapidly changing. We needed to get the word out. We also needed to reassure them that they were safe to come to work and how to safely care for patients. And so one of the things that were really um, critically important and effective was the use of town halls. So having a way to communicate with our employees, but then also an ability at the and to have Q&A so people could um, you know, enter questions and get their questions asked and answered in real time. And anything that we didn't get to, we were able to post on a website. We had an email inbox that people could send their questions to. And so always having that two-way dialogue in order to keep people um, reassured was really crucially important. And you can see at the bottom here, infection prevention crosses all of these task forces. So we are, serve as the subject matter expert. Um, we're also the consultant. We're a partner. We're a troubleshooter. Um, we're really we're a decision maker. And so really every aspect of the, the task force involved infection prevention expertise. Next slide. 
And these are some of the roles that we take on. So with the expertise that we're providing, we are trying to prevent infections to our patients and our staff through the best evidence-based practices. And so Jessica mentioned there were things that we didn't know. Um, they, especially at the early on in the pandemic, we had to make decisions with um, very little data and evidence. And then as time went on, we had to change that information. We said, okay, well, we know new and um, we have better information and we have more data now. And so this is how we're gonna ask you to do things. And so that was happening continuously, um, especially early on. We provide the education and the training and the consultation to all aspects of healthcare. And so a lot of times people think the doctors, the nurses, but um, we are also talking to the people who are pulling the trash, who are working in the kitchen, who are you know cleaning the patient rooms, um, who deliver our linens. And we really have to um, be present for all of these different people and be able to explain to them in concepts that they understand. And so, um, not everyone has healthcare training in order to be able to understand and digest how they keep themselves safe. We were also the resource for interpreting guidelines and developing policies for our institution. And so anytime there was a new update from the CDC or the local health department or the state health department, we would read it, we would digest it, and then we would say, how does this apply to our patient population? And then we would develop the policies and the education and the communication plan um, to, to roll that out to our employees. There's a lot of data collection, analysis, and public health reporting um, in the role of an infection preventionist. And um, we, we don't really know how to respond to things if we don't track and analyze the data that we're collecting to inform those decisions. We also, as I mentioned before, resources and assets were a huge part of the pandemic response. We were reviewing all products and supplies um, in order to make sure they were safe for our patients and our employees and, and becoming very innovative with, you know, potentially are we going to have to make masks and um, how are we going to get hand sanitizer in? And then we also are constantly assessing the safety of the physical design of our building and the environment of care. So you think about, we stand up these testing centers or people put these tents outside to deal with overflow for the emergency department. We are the ones saying like, is this safe? Like, how are we maintaining, um, you know, physical barriers, um, proper airflow? Are, is the environment clean and, and safe for our patients? and our families. And then lastly, we respond to exposures, outbreaks, and clusters of infectious diseases. Next slide. I wanted to show you a couple examples of some things, um, how to apply what infection prevention was doing with the different buckets of the task force. And so you can see in the upper left-hand corner, this is a communication icon that we used um, really in our emails to remind staff that they needed to uh, do a symptom checker. So they needed to just kind of think before they came to work and say, do I have any mild symptoms that maybe feel different than yesterday? We needed to remind them about their personal protective equipment, so universal masking and eye protection and maintaining that physical distance. And then we also wanted to remind them of the importance of hand hygiene. And below that, you can see a picture of one of our testing operation centers. And so you might wonder, well, what does infection prevention have to do? We don't actually do the testing, but early on in the pandemic, we were helping to identify who might need to be tested because it was a limited resource. We also were getting creative um, and working with the staff on what do we do when it got really hot um, and their PPE was really hot? Is there other PPE that could be more breathable or cooler? And then it got cold and then their fingers were really cold. And are there better gloves that can still maintain um, cleanliness and let them clean their hands quickly in between patients? And so those were things that infection prevention were um, was constantly troubleshooting. On the other side of the slide, you can see our communications with families. And so one of the things that we identified early on is, you know, mask wearing was very new for our families. This was not something we had previously been asking them to do routinely. Um, and while healthcare workers um, wear masks for all sorts of different reasons, our families really didn't know what was the right type of mask to wear and, and even how to wear it. And so reminding people, you know, to keep their mouth and their nose covered and reminding people um, and, and perhaps providing them with a mask, the appropriate mask if they had come into the facility facility wearing a bandana or um, you know, mask that had a, a filter on it. So you can see our communication there. I think one of the things we needed to get better at was um, because things were changing so quickly, we um, almost always had them just in English. And so we have evolved over time, especially with our symptom check-in and our exposure checks to make sure that we have those in multiple different languages and so that we are um, communicating effectively with all of our families. In the middle, you can see our hand sanitizer from Faber Distilleries. And so this was something that we were critically running out of early in the pandemic, having a very hard time storing 
sourcing hand sanitizer and a distiller reached out to us and said, hey, can we help? Um, and so because we are infection preventionists, we were familiar with the World Health Organization's uh, formula for hand sanitizer. And so we were able to recommend um, how you would go about making your own. And then we partnered with our pharmacy and our research departments and how um, and our safety departments to make sure that this facility was um, you know, kind of up to snuff and would be able to do this for us in a clean and aseptic way. And um, I remember the Sunday morning when we had this, the delivery of these vodka bottles um, that had hand sanitizer in it, and we were um, you know, excited and, and cheering and able to kind of bridge that gap until we had a better supply source. Next slide. I wanted to talk a little bit about the stages of the pandemic because one of the things I get asked very often is when we have these surges and then right after the surge, it's kind of um, you know, assumed that infection prevention doesn't maybe have anything to do. And so, um, you know, people are like, is it better for you now? And I wanted to share, you know, it doesn't, the pandemic has always been here. It's always been here for infection preventionists and, and for all of us in the community. And while we've had surges, there's always been work to do, even um, during the valleys of the surge. So you can see the daily trends in cases here. And while we have peaks and valleys, there is always ongoing work um, to make sure that we're ready for the, for the next stage. And so I wanted to break this down for what the different roles of infection preventionists have evolved to be during each of these stages. At the beginning, there was a pl planning and initial response period. I'm um, really starting in January through the end of May. Near the end of May, we started hearing, we need to get people back into the office. You know, people have been delaying their care. They're getting sicker. They haven't seen their doctor in two months. We really had to think about how do we safely get these people back um, and partner with our facilities on things like waiting room distancing and what are we going to, um, communicating with our families what they need to wear when they come into the visit, screening them appropriately, and preparing our staff to come back and provide care. And then we had this massive surge in the the late fall and um, winter months. And so this was really a strain on census everywhere um, and you know, just caring for these massive amounts of COVID patients that we saw during this time period. Um, near the end of that time period, we started seeing vaccinations um, impacting that peak. And so we were rolling out vaccinations for our employees and we started rolling out vaccinations for our, um, our patients as that got approved for younger age groups. And at the same time, we were starting to see this light at the end of the tunnel of maybe being able to plan for return to work. Um, and could we get our employees back into the office and how do we do that safely? And then we entered into this new stage that we're in now, which is this unvaccinated surge. And certainly being from a pediatric facility, this has been an area of concern for us as our patient population is not old enough to be vaccinated. And so that is um, a place that we, we worry about, you know, seeing potential influx of patients. So I just wanted to show this as an example of how um, infection preventionists has adapted and been flexible um, and really responded to the emergent needs at each part of this pandemic process. Next slide. I wanted to leave with some lessons learned. Um, I think the, the biggest one is really being adaptive and flexible has been crucially important. But if I could go back in time and, and talk to um, the Sarah Smathers of, of early 2020, I would really say to do better um, contingency planning not just for supplies, as we've mentioned that a lot, but also for people. Um, and so people leaving healthcare, um, you know, the crisis of having to provide childcare for you know, homeschooling your patients and the burden on all types of healthcare workers has really led to, um, you know, changes in how people are staffing their departments. And for departments like ours that are small but critical, really needed to think about surge planning. So we were thinking about surge planning in terms of where are we going to put patients, but how do you um, go from staffing a Monday through Friday nine to five department to 24 seven for 20 plus months? Um, and that goes for infection prevention, but also emergency preparedness and occupational health. Um, we did have to do this during the pandemic. So we stood up a contact tracing center, we stood up a communication center, but having planned for that ahead of time would have made that um, much more, it would have been easier to do, um, and we'd be better able to do that in, in, in the time if we had already identified those resources ahead of time. 
And then lastly, Jessica had mentioned this, but the ongoing, ongoing funding support is going to be critical for the pandemic preparedness. This work cannot continue without the dedicated resources to make that happen. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to see the investment. There's a $2.1 billion investment um, in infection prevention and targeting healthcare um, facilities, especially long-term care facilities and public health, where I think you're going to see a surge in the job and the need for infection preventionists in these areas. And also hopefully, um, ongoing pandemic preparedness so that we learn the lessons from the past um, and that we need to maintain our readiness and be prepared for whatever comes next. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a terrific overview of the major issues that you've had to encounter in the last 18 months. And thanks to both of you for such thorough, detailed snapshots into into your world in the, in the, at the front lines of public health and healthcare in the last 18 months. We do have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. So I guess I will ask participants to uh, type some questions into the Q&A um, uh, link at the bottom of your screen. We'd be happy to take questions from you. Uh, while we're waiting for folks to do that, I, maybe I'll get started. and. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I think has been so challenging in the context of public health emergency preparedness and really just public health practice broadly is the way in which public health departments integrate with and interact with the healthcare system. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to know from each of you, uh, how did you think that went in the pandemic, at least from your own perspectives? And um, how has it gone? What lessons have been learned in terms of the bridges that either currently exist or perhaps need to be built between the public health and the personal health or healthcare systems. Maybe, uh, I don't know who wants to go first. Sarah, you look like you took your mic off. So it looks to me like you might have a, a thought, a thought to express. I, I'm happy to, I think, you know, experience probably varies across the country. I would say from my perspective, and I've been in this role for, for 12 years, um, the Philadelphia Department of Public Health has always been a tremendous partner for us. Um, I know that's not true everywhere, and I think there there is some challenges, and in particularly in areas you know where I live, there is not a health department in, in Delaware County. And so, um, and that's true in, in a lot of parts of the country that you may not have a local or a state health department that you can um, you know, rely on either because they're underfunded or because they, they don't exist. I would agree with what Sarah said. I think there were already existing channels and frameworks and various ways in which public health and healthcare have been collaborating together over a number of years. And I think we saw a lot of um, really productive work happen between the two sectors with this pandemic. And I can just think of a, a lot of work that we've done very closely with our hospital systems, our FQHCs and other health centers to really get vaccine distributed, you know, primary care practices, even pharmacies have been really integral to, to this whole process. So I, I think we've had some real successes here that maybe maybe are not have not been replicated in other parts of the country. And I think it speaks to just long-term existing relationships and partnerships uh, that exist locally. Thank you. Yeah, from my vantage point, I would agree with that. I think that, uh, it's really been remarkable to see, particularly here in Philadelphia, the, the integration and coordination between, between hospitals and healthcare entities and public health. And hopefully those, will, those relationships will, will pay dividends in future emergencies. Uh, there's a question from, a, from an audience member. What is the plan for wide availability of timely COVID-19 testing? That may be a question that uh, isn't, isn't necessarily in the control of, of local actors, but uh, Perhaps you have some insights on that one? I can just speak from, from the health department perspective. I think the, you know, it's recognized that the testing has gone through these various stages of limited availability, better availability. I think we're back to more limited availability. At least I know Sarah mentioned this, and I think it's what we're seeing also. Uh, so I think one of the plans here is to, again, like our vaccine program, to really try to create places that are in local neighborhoods where there is more access and to try to supplement the existing access that, that might have that might occur in, in you know among traditional healthcare partners. Uh, it's just it's a challenging time when we have cases on the rise, we have variants, there's a lot happening. And so I, I know that there is work being done 
in our COVID containment division to try to address uh, some of the scarcity of testing and, and the uh, you know times that people now are waiting for testing. So I, I, it's definitely recognized as an issue and I think some creative thinking is going to try to address it. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I'm going to ask another question. This is from another participant who is in Florida, uh, who acknowledges that her health department was excellent in advising of current information and coordination of vaccines. What do you think is where is the, what it, where is the best resource for the latest, most accurate information for healthcare providers? What are, what are your thoughts about that one? I would go with CDC. And uh, they're usually very good at about uh, updating uh, different pages. Um, also the health advisory network, again, I mentioned, I think is a great way for people to receive, especially healthcare providers to receive updated guidance when there are changes. Um, definitely reflecting back on the early months of the pandemic when information was changing just about minute to minute. Um, I think it was really difficult then for the most updated information to become available, but I think CDC is always you know, a, good, a good resource. I think they're pretty fast at updating guidance. And then usually local health departments, I would say are, you know, try to pick that up pretty quickly and get it out there as well. So those would be, those would be my recommendations. Thank you, Sarah. Where do you, where, I was thinking the pediatric arena has really seen so much change in the last just six to 12 months. What, where do you all go? Yeah, I was going to recommend the uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Vaccine Education Center. And so I know um, I just fellow moms have come to me and asked, you know, are you going to vaccinate your kids and where, where do I get information? And um, I send everybody there. There's wonderful videos that answer really um, all the questions people have and debunk a lot of myths that are out there. And so I would um, use that resource as well. Thank you. Uh, another question, what strategies have your institutions used to try to increase vaccine acceptance among your employees? I know this is a cutting edge question, something that I know most many organizations in the, in the nonprofit and for-profit sector are managing right now, and as well as government agencies. I had mentioned during the talk that we I found town halls to be really invaluable, and I think um, it really served as a way where employees could have a voice. Um, and so we were giving information, but it wasn't just pushing information out. Uh, we were staying on the line and answering question, you know, question by question. Um, and then when we saw that there was a theme. Um, and maybe some misinformation, we could address that specifically and provide additional information on, on that. And so I, I do think listening to what the concerns are. Um, I also think, you know, it's hard to do this when you have 20 something thousand employees, you know, if you're a big organization, but really those one on one conversations are really important. I know just in, in the community and talking to friends and neighbors, um, my own grandmother, I, I changed her mind and got her vaccinated. And so I think it's really important that we have those conversations and we share as a trusted resource, um, you know, good information with people. Thanks. Yeah, I would agree. I think the the one on one conversations are pretty important. I, I know, again, in a large organization, it's, it may be difficult to accomplish that. But I know from the community side of things, I think that those one on one conversations have definitely made a difference uh, for some people. And I think just also sharing accurate, up to date information that is understandable is also really important. Um, so I know some of that has happened through some communications that the city has put out to employees. Um, yeah, so I would just echo what, what Sarah has just shared. So I know that uh, many institutions, including the Philadelphia uh, city government and uh, healthcare hospitals are mandating COVID vaccine now. And I guess I'm curious to know how your institutions respectively have experienced that mandate and is there much opposition or is it too, is are these just early days and we'll see how this goes in the coming weeks? It's still early days for us. Uh, and I, you know, I can only really speak at a very small scale about what I see and what I know, but so I think it's, it's still a little bit early days um, and there's still time. The, the mandate hasn't kicked in yet. So I think we'll know more after the mandate actually uh, kicks in um, soon. Sarah, did you want to I, share I just, No, I agree with Jessica. I was just going to say we still have some time left, and so we have to see how this all plays out. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to point out that some other uh, participants have noticed, noted some other useful information sources, the Department of Health and Human Services, the DHHS website, um, uh, that, and uh, also NIH has some very useful uh, information on the latest in cutting edge treatments, et cetera. Um, so there are some questions about uh, outcomes and uh, data related to COVID outbreaks versus fully vaccinated on in fully vaccinated versus unvaccinated populations, and questions around natural immunity. I don't know if either of you want to weigh in on those topics. Um, I think there's a there's a lot of data, uh, and certainly emerging data on on outcomes of infection among vaccinated and fully vaccinated populations and as well as unvaccinated populations. I think there's some really compelling information around correlations between unvaccinated populations and high disease rates. I think we have pretty excellent data on the effectiveness of vaccines in real world settings in the context of certainly preventing severe sequelae of complications and death. And I think we're learning more and more about breakthrough disease, which, which we, I think, are recognizing absolutely occurs, but is, is it does appear to be significantly milder, much less frequent than among unvaccinated people, as well as um, um, you know, uh, something that something that probably increases over time, particularly in elderly people and immunosuppressed folks post vaccination. Uh, there's a question about natural immunity, which I think is challenging. Um, I think what we're learning about natural immunity is that there isn't a single uh, immune response to actual natural infection, and there are probably folks who. Uh, have significant antibodies and immune response to natural infection and maintain immune protection post-infection. And there's probably a large percentage of people who don't. And I think the reality of it is that there's a huge spread of immune response after actual natural infection. And it's probably not reliable to assume that most people post-natural infection are immune or protected, which is why there is a recommendation to, to vaccinate folks who've had uh, COVID, uh, COVID infection. So there's a question here, and I think we have probably time for one more, which is um, how does the public, how does the Department of Public Health reach the, the vaccine hesitant communities? And what are the kind of outreach strategies that you've tried? And there might be even a healthcare correlate to that. So Jessica, perhaps you can answer and then we'll turn to Sarah. Uh, sure, so I think it's been a lot of strategies. Uh, one in particular that um, I think has had some success is that we have partnered with Philly Counts uh, the organization in Philadelphia that um, is doing a lot of door-to-door -door work around uh, voting registration. And they were able to partner with us to do uh, neighborhood canvassing. Uh, they have a lot of community neighborhood connections and are in touch with a lot of trusted leaders. And so we have worked very closely with them to try to utilize some of those networks and to rely on a lot of the staff uh, who have been able to go door to door, do canvassing, have those one on one conversations. So that's been one strategy. Uh, we we put out a lot of information through different networks that we have. Uh, there have been town halls and other information sessions. Uh, I think one of the things that um, you know has proven most effective is is just trying to work through trusted community partners and trusted messengers, and try to partner on information sessions. Uh, we are often out doing what we call info desks. So those are just tabling events where we might set up at a community partner location or we'll be doing some in some transportation centers, uh, other highly trafficked pedestrian areas where we're just there to answer questions, provide information about vaccine, provide information about testing, um, answer questions that people may have. Um, and so I think that's you know just trying to be out in the community to be available, to be accessible, those different mechanisms, I think, have been some of our uh, some of our best practices. Thank you. I uh, wasn't sure if Sarah wanted, did you want to add to that in terms of, of the your within the hospital community in terms of the vaccine hesitant folks? Yeah, you know, we've been a strong partner with PDPH, and so we've um, at, been at a lot of these community events too, um, trying to to help support vaccination efforts from um, you know school teachers to um, you know different different types of community based activities. But one of the things that um, we are also looking at is how do we identify those patients who come into the hospital for maybe a different reason? They're not here for COVID at all, um, and but we have an opportunity to talk to them about the vaccine and get them vaccinated while they're here. Um, and so making sure that we're identifying um, you know that maybe they're not here for anything in fact related, but that we could use that as an opportunity to get them vaccinated. Thank you. Thanks to both of you for these uh, 
interesting and important answers. So it looks like we are certainly over time and probably need to draw the session to a close. So thanks to the participants who joined us. And I wanna thank both of you, Sarah and Jessica for your presentations today. And as a faculty member at Drexel, it's my pleasure to work with you as colleagues. And I wanna thank you for the teaching you do at the university, but also for the great work you're doing in, uh, in your professional lives. So thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your experiences. It's very informative. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you all again for joining us and a special thank you to our presenters for taking their time to be with us and share their expertise. Have a great